It is finished. Jesus cries these words out. very last of all the words that he says on the cross that we have recorded for us in the Gospels. It is finished. But what is finished? What was finished on this Good Friday so long ago? Certainly, as we look around us, it seems sometimes that there's not a lot that is finished. It seems as if nothing is finished. It seems as if everything is going on just as it has since the day of Adam and Eve's fall in the garden. So what is it that is finished? What is it that Jesus did? What is it that he accomplished on the cross? It's a good question, brothers and sisters. When we look at pandemics and political turmoil and we look at the fighting that there is between brothers and sisters and friends and family and all the people of this world, when we look at our own imperfections, when we look at the ways in which we fall short, when we look at simple things like how the creation itself seems to groan with the pain of the various things that we do to it, when we see crops wither and die in droughts or in floods, when we see people homeless because of hurricanes or other natural disasters, when we see people being persecuted for their faith, whatever that faith may be, when people, when people are persecuted because of the color of their skin or the ethnicity that they have, how can we say that anything is finished? And yet this is what our Lord says. And we believe him, don't we? We believe that when he cries out this, these words, it is finished, that there is something indeed that has been finished. Jesus is not lying to us. He's not telling a falsehood, nor is Jesus himself deceived. Jesus knows the truth. For goodness sakes, Jesus is the truth. And so what is it that is finished? And what does being finished mean from God's perspective? And how can that comfort us on this Good Friday of 2021? Well, first of all, of course, we need to remember that things can be finished before they're finished, <laughs> right? Think about your favorite story, your favorite novel, your favorite book, right? There, there is the, the rising action, and I can't help it. I taught English for a while, so I can't help it. But there's the rising action of the plot where things get more and more intense, and sometimes it eases off a little bit, but then it goes right back up, and eventually it hits the climax of the story. And when it hits the climax of the story, that is the the beginning of the end. One could properly say that it is finished there. 
It's like the person who, who has been searching and searching and searching to find the perfect gift for the one that they love. Searching and searching or maybe working and making and, and, and carving and, and sewing and whatever it is they are doing. They have been crafting or finding exactly the right thing, maybe for months. The thing that says exactly what they want to say to their loved one. And finally, they find it. They purchase it. It arrives at their door. You could say, even though the gift has not been given, even though the gift is not wrapped in a box, even though it doesn't have the bow or the card, even though those things have not been finished, you could say very truly, it is finished. The present has been purchased. The long wait is over. The, the, the work and the planning and the thinking and the the. the all of that is finished. And now it's just remaining to tie it up in a beautiful bow. And we need to remember that and never forget it. That a large part of what Jesus is saying here. Is that it is finished in this sense. It is not finished as in we have reached the final page of the story and everything is already wrapped up in a neat bow and we see it and have received it fully and completely. It's not wrapped up in that sort of way. It's not finished in that sort of way, although the, the, the climax has dictated what that end will be. God knows exactly what the present is, and God knows that it is a sure delivery for us. It is going to happen. But we haven't fully received it yet. But brothers and sisters, that will come. The Bible tells us that Christ will return. And that he will judge the living and the dead. And that he will make all things new, creating a new heaven and a new earth. And there will be no more sorrow. And there will be no more crying. And there will be no more fighting and war and sin and death. For the old order will pass away. And God will dwell with people in a new heaven and a new earth. So brothers and sisters, that is one of the ways in which it is finished. But we do not see it fully yet. In the meantime, this process, this time we are in is the time, as it were, of, of God putting it in the, the proper box and putting the bow on it and preparing the, the final touches and so on. But it is also a time of grace for us. Not just us as in you and me, but us as in the entire human race. The Bible says very clearly that it is God's will that none should perish, but that all should have eternal life. And Jesus, is said, it is said of him that he came to reconcile all things to himself. And so this, this time period during which we... We know that Jesus has said it is finished, but yet we still see the strife and the struggle and the pain and the sorrow and the death and the, and the, and the sin, both within ourselves and outside of this world or outside of us in this world. This time is a time of grace, as hard as it might be 
to see that sometimes. It is a time of grace in which we as Christ followers are called to share the good news so that we can be the hands and the feet of Jesus. So that we can share God's love and his mercy. So we can share what Jesus did on the cross not just with what we say, but also with what we do with all of those around us. Which comes to the second way in which it is finished. You see, Jesus, yes, Jesus did come to conquer sin and death for us because we could not do it ourselves. But also, Jesus came to show, to tangibly demonstrate for us just how much God loved us. Just how much God loves us. And not again, not just us, but every person who has ever been or will be. And so Jesus' entire life, especially his public ministry that we witness through the Gospels, that was partly a demonstration for us. He was demonstrating his love, God's love, for the world through his words and his actions. I don't know if you know the children's story. I forget what it's called, but it's, it's, I think it's called I Love You to the Moon and Back or something like this. And the story goes basically like this. Forgive me for paraphrasing, but basically, um, you know, the, the child says to the mother, you know, I love you this much. And the mom, or the child says, sorry, I love you this much with his arms outstretched. And the mom says, I love you this much with, with her arms outstretched. And of course, her arms are much bigger than the child's arms. And, and so the child is, is pondering, what, what does, like, what can I say? Because I love my mother, you know, more than just my arms will reach. My love for her is so much bigger than my arms will reach. And so the child says, I love you. And maybe I'm getting this wrong again. Sorry. But I love you to the moon and back. Jesus shows us that he loves us, to paraphrase Toy Story, to infinity and beyond. He shows this in every step of his gospel journey, and he shows us most of all, and finally and completely on that cross where he does not call upon the angels of God to rescue him from the cross. He does not pull himself off of it. He does not descend in wrath, righteous wrath, upon the people who have, who have persecuted him and who have been killing him. Instead, he says, I love you so much that I would die for you. And the Father, together with the Son, won in all the ways says, I love you so much that I would give up my only son for you. And the Spirit together with them, one triune Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Spirit testifies that Jesus is doing exactly what the Father has asked of him, and they are all doing it out of love. And so Jesus in this moment when he cries out, it is finished, he is not only saying it is finished, I have conquered sin and death, but he is also saying it is finished. I have demonstrated in all the ways that I can, including my own death, that I, that God, that we, the great three in one, that I love you. There is nothing more I can do to show you 
that I love you. And the third way in which it is finished is that Jesus not only came to conquer sin and death for us, he not only came to show us how much God loved us, but he also came to show us what it really means to be human. You see, with our fall into sin, in, in the Garden of Eden so long ago and ever since then, we have not really known what it actually means, what it actually tangibly looks like to live as real, proper, created human beings were meant to live. We are so tangled up with selfishness and self-worship and pride and arrogance and idolatry and all those things. We are so tied up with those things that we didn't, we can't see what it looks like to really be human. And so Jesus shows us that too. Jesus says that we are to love our neighbor. Jesus says that our neighbor includes everyone, including our enemies. Jesus says we are to love our enemies. Jesus says we are to, uh, we are to sacrifice for them. Greater love, he says, has no one than this, that a person would lay down their life for their friend. Jesus shows us that in the kingdom, in the kingdom of God, in, in the way that we were really meant to live, we have top down or we have bottom up, upside down. That's the word I'm looking for. Upside down leadership where Jesus washes the feet of the disciples and says, do this for each other. Where Jesus hangs out with the broken and the sick and the drunk and the, and the tax collectors and the prostitutes and he hangs around with them and loves them. And he shows us that that is how people were meant to live. That's how we were created to be. And then ultimately on the cross, he shows us finally, totally, completely what it means to be human. To be human doesn't mean fighting for power. To be human doesn't mean revenge and wrathfulness against our fellow human beings. It does not mean judgment against them or looking down upon them. Instead, it looks like sacrificing everything even for those who hate you. That's what humans do. Humans were created to love. And so, when Jesus says, it is finished, he is saying, there. I have shown them what it means to be human. I have reminded them of something they forgot when they fell into sin in the garden so long ago. I have shown them now. Please, he says. Do what I have done. If you love me, you will obey my commands. And what is the greatest command? To love your neighbor as yourself. To love the Lord your God with your heart, with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. These two are the greatest commandment. So, brothers and sisters, what is finished on Good Friday? It is finished. Jesus has conquered sin and death for us. 
It is finished. Jesus has demonstrated God's love for us. It is finished. Jesus has shown us, reminded us of what it means to be human. It is finished. The pain and the sorrow and the struggle that we see now are all part of the denouement, the wrapping up of everything. And it may not feel that way to us right now. And I'm sure that in stories, if the fictional characters could talk, it may not feel like that to them totally all the time either. But nonetheless, not only is Easter Sunday coming, but so too is that final and great and total and complete presentation of the new reality where everything is healed and whole. That Easter is coming as well. And so, brothers and sisters, let us live in the truth that it is finished. Let us be the witnesses who spread the good news that it is finished. In the words that we say and in the deeds that we do, in, in how we love God, in how we love our neighbor, in how we live out hope in this world that is sometimes so dark. Let us live as if we knew the truth that it is finished. Amen.